Hey, Michael. All right, let's Michael. get video rolling. Can you see me? Can you hear me? Michael, can you hear me? Hi. I can hear you. Okay, I'm going to bring your folks in the rest of them right now, okay? Okay. Thank you. Hey, Mike. Hello, everybody. Just to here? Come for Martin to get everybody in the room. Okay, Mike, um, all your folks are in so far? Right. Okay, and I assume that the telephone call can't bring into? No, they're dialing in right now. So they're uh, uh, phone number 694. They can talk at the moment. And um, have a good meeting. I'll continue to bring your folks in. Uh, let me know if you need anything, okay? All right, thank you. Bye. All righty. Um, let's see. I think everybody should have control over their own microphones. So um, if you want just try to unmute yourself and you can test to see make sure you're heard it's bela hi everyone chris rick solomon whoops i'm sorry rick solomon I only see uh two pictures yours and mine michael is that correct right so if anyone wants their picture up um by all means just hit the start um you know where it shows the short hey, start start video god i can talk uh, that will bring you up. There we go. Good. Yes, we see people now. <laughs> All right. Fantastic. So we'll just give a moment for everyone to kind of bring up everybody. And then we'll start the meeting in about yeah, one or two minutes. And then do we, do we want to leave our uh, mics muted or on? Night. Let's, uh, in general, kind of mute them, but if you want to chime in, it's a little bit more informal than, than uh, the general board meeting where, you know, I, somebody would have to unmute you. I feel like everyone's kind of in charge of their own muting and unmuting. Okay. But if you, especially if you've got background noises, then definitely highly recommend stay muted. <laughs> Otherwise, then nobody could hear. Yeah, I'm not sure what that's about, Bela, but we'll be good. I'm cooking, <laughs> I'm cooking dinner. I'm going back to cooking. When you come back on, I'll come back. Okay. Um, and then, yeah, for LAPD, I think being in the same room, you might have some feedback between the two of okay. you. So, I'll mute it. So just, um, you know, whenever you're ready, one it, just only one at a time, unmute yourself. Um, hey, Michael, real quick, um, if uh, multiple folks, even in the webinar, are unmuted, it might have a lot of feedback just because they're all unmuted at once. So just be aware of that. Right. No, no. We yeah, know. Cool, cool. All right. We got it. We've done this before. <laughs> all right. Uh, we'll give up till 6.55 and then we'll start the meeting. Actually, let me get my notepad. So I will need that. And we'll wait for that magic moment to tick by and then we'll start the meeting. All righty. 
Welcome everybody to the public safety meeting of the South Robertson Neighborhoods Council. Uh, we meet the first Monday of every month. And now that we've got all the technological stuff down, we'll be meeting from here on in on this Zoom um, channel, for lack of a better word. So we'll be using this same login for each and every time for our monthly meeting. Um, I will say, however, that I need to find a co-host or somebody to host the meeting for September's meeting, but I'll get to that in a minute. So there, there may be an issue with September's meeting that I won't know about until tomorrow, but I'll go over that momentarily. Anyways, uh, let's start the meeting by going around the room <laughs> and everybody introducing yourself. Um, start with me, I guess. I'm Mike Lynn. I, I chair the Public Safety Committee and have been on the South Robertson Neighbor Council General Board for since 2010. And then I, I'll call on people as we go to keep it in line. Let's start with our LAPD. Uh, Chris, you wanna take it? Yes, Chris Ragsdale, uh, the senior lead officer covering the uh, east side of Pico Robertson, Crestview and La Cienega Heights community. And then I've got my partner here and I'll let him introduce himself. He's sitting in for uh, Chris Baker. You're on. Hello all. My name is Officer Bermudez. Uh, I'm actually covering for uh, Officer Baker. Sorry for the feedback right now. We're in the same office. This is the first time I've actually done Zoom conference. But I'm sitting in for uh, Officer Baker right now. So any emails, any phone calls that are pretty much coming in for Officer Baker, I'll be receiving them. I'll be responding to them. Uh, so in his absence, I'll be standing in. Hey, fantastic. Thank you. Uh, let's move to Rick Solomon. There we go. Great. Rick Solomon. Uh, I'm with the Volunteer Community Patrol, so I work with uh, the senior leads with Chris and soon to work with uh, Jose on Wednesday. So uh, Beverly Wood residents for um, my whole life. Okay, next up, Revital Amir. Yes, hi. Uh, I live in the neighborhood and I just want to get involved. That's, that's it. <laughs> And Bela. Unmute. Sorry about that. Um, Bela Rahm. I'm a part of the Public Safety Committee. I'm not a, a board member, and I'm interested in public safety. Melinda. Hi, everybody. Um, Melinda Chorn. Um, I am a resident uh, near Venice Boulevard. Uh, nice to see everybody. And is that Nissan? 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 I'm not sure how to pronounce your name. So tell us how to pronounce it. But you got to unmute yourself. All right, we'll come back to Nissan in a minute. Jason. Go ahead and unmute yourself and introduce yourself. Hi, Jason, just a resident in the community here to discuss uh, some of the homelessness uh, underneath the Garth overpass on the agenda tonight. Shana. Hi, I'm actually in um, Carlsbad, California, visiting my niece, but uh, I'm tuned in and uh, Member of the Soros uh, Safety Committee. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Hi, Shana. Okay, uh, let's see. Did we do Jason? Okay, so next would be uh, Richard. Mr. Bloom. Hello, Richard Bloom. All right, we'll come back to Richard. Melissa. I'm, I'm sorry, I was... Oh, go ahead. Switching. I'm sorry, I was switching locations. Just to introduce cut. yourself. Yeah, uh, I uh, apologize. Uh, I'm Rich Bloom. I'm on the uh, uh, Soro Neighborhood Council, and I'm a member of the Public Safety Committee. Fantastic. Okay, now Melissa. Hi, my name is Melissa. I'm, I'm a resident of uh, the Beverly Wood adjacent. Um, I'm a daycare owner in the neighborhood, and I'm just... Uh, 
my first time joining. So just wanted to hear what's going on in the neighborhood. Okay, and telephone caller ending in 694. Area code 203 ending in 694. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi, everybody. This is Ellen Snyder. I live on Olin Street, and I'm just here to get updates about what's going on in the neighborhood. Thank you, Ellen. And back to Nissan. One last try. Are you there? Okay. Oh, and wait, we do have one more Mark Silverman. Mark Silverman, go ahead and introduce yourself. Good evening, everybody. Mark Silverman. Um, I See, you're kind of way off in the background, so you'll probably need to turn up your microphone a little bit for us to hear you going forward. Anyways, okay, so let's uh, proceed to the next thing. Um, um, Martin Epstein, did you introduce Martin Epstein? Oh, sorry, sorry. And our president of our neighbor council and the ultimate host of all meetings, yeah. Martin Epstein. How are you doing? I'm in my garage right now, but uh, welcome everyone to this meeting. And uh, if you need anything, Mike, just holler. I'm around and I will... Uh, let you get back to it, but thanks. Thank you, thank you. And I should tell you, I'm calling or I'm zooming in today from West Bloomfield, Michigan. Um, I was supposed to be donating a kidney to my mom uh, two days from now, but as it turns out, uh, some circumstances have pushed it back to the beginning of September. So I'll be here. And it's very possible that the surgery date will be on that first Monday, um, you know, after Labor Day. So uh, keep an eye out on the, looking out for the agenda for any date changes and or time changes and or uh, somebody else leading the meeting if I'm not able to. Uh, basically, as long as I'm not under the knife, I'll be around, I'll lead the meeting. Kidney or no kidney. Anyways, <laughs> so just wanted to give you that update for the moment. Um, and then let's see. Next up, let's go to general public comment. And this would be for anything safety related, health or safety related, that is not on the agenda. So does anyone have anything that's not on the agenda? Melinda, go ahead. Um, thank you. I just have two comments. Um, I just want to say a quick thank you to Officer Bermudez uh, for responding to a request that we sent to Chris uh, in his absence via email. Just want to thank you for taking prompt action and going the extra mile um, in resolving our issues. I know it's, it might still be ongoing, but I just wanted to uh, say thank you for that. Um, and then uh, the other comment that I wanted to make was in reference to the flea market that's happening on Venice Boulevard. Uh, just a quick update, I know that Chris is still working with um, the Department of Transportation uh, before he left or street services, uh, but just wanna let you guys know that that flea market's still going strong. Um, they've now grown into grow standing tents for their merchandise, um, many bicycles for sale. Um, no idea where they're from, uh, but you know, sometimes they're, often they're trash left behind, um, you know, after the flea market is over, um, which is, you know, unfortunate for the residents. But just want to let you guys know that that's still happening. Thank you. Okay. And hang on, let me just do one quick thing real quickly. Okay, good. There we go. Okay. So thank you very much. Any other, um, Rick, did you have something? Unmute. Thank you. No, I'm fine. Uh, I think the agenda is going to take care of the, the Garth Tunnel. So we're okay. fine. We're good. Thank you. Beautiful. All righty. So with that, we're going to move forward to our crime report from LAPD. Um, either one of you, take it away. Good evening. Uh, this is Chris Ragsdale again. Uh, for A59, we're continuing to see trending of primarily auto-related crimes. So during the nighttime, overnight hours, we have people, I've been actually receiving some video where we have people, sometimes uh, up to three, uh, literally walking down the street, 
door checking cars that are on the street and then getting into carports or secured uh, subterranean garages and then doing the same to the vehicles in the garages. Uh, as a result of these crimes, the area does remain a mission area. So that means there's a uh, specific focus, not only by uniform patrol officers, but we're also use, utilizing our undercover assets and surveillance uh, assets to include vice and our narcotics people that are working in that area, monitoring for the same thing as well. Uh, residential burglaries were up in that category as well. Uh, but not as significantly as the grand theft autos and uh, the vehicle crime. So it's basically what we're seeing our cars being taken or ransacked. Uh, one thing I want to speak about because last week we discovered about, oh, just over 50% of all our stolens uh, that occurred last week had uh, key fobs in the car. So what happens is when these individuals are door checking cars, the door opens, they'll sit down, they'll get in the car, and while they're ransacking it, they'll also just push on the brake and depress the start button if it's one of the newer vehicles that has a start button. And if the car starts, they now drive off with the vehicle. Uh, they've got a car at their disposal, uh, whether you know, they're using it to, for transportation or to commit a crime but we're seeing a, a significant amount of the cars being taken that have this issue with key fobs being left in the car. So that's the one thing I wanna just kind of reiterate and focus on in terms of talking to our neighbors and communities about you know, making sure not only that we're not keeping valuables in the car, but we're also locking them and keeping all keys and fobs out of the car. That's all I've got. Thank you. And you're up for me. So just going back on what Officer Rogersdale just mentioned about vehicles and uh, keys that are being left inside the vehicles. When you purchase a vehicle, most times the dealers uh, tell you, yeah, you get two keys. I said one normally they throw in the glove box. Uh, just the other day, working patrol, we got into a car pursuit with a stolen vehicle that, that ran through... Um, Rainier Park area off of Holmes, and they ended up uh, crashing in um, off of Cadillac. So uh, just to verify, you guys can hear me, correct? Yes. Okay, awesome. So we were able to take uh, one person to custody. I believe that vehicle was stolen from the area. So um, yeah, that, that's going to be one of the biggest concerns for this week. Uh, most of them are Grand Theft Autos, a lot of stolen vehicles. Uh, another concern that I've been getting emails in regards to is uh, homeless encampments. Um, what I've been notifying everyone is, uh, like anything, if you guys have an issue with uh, some type of nuisance, call it in. I know a lot of people don't want to call it in because they believe it's a nuisance. Regardless, just call it in. We'll respond no matter what. We'll make contact with uh, whoever um, phone in. If uh, you don't want to meet with PD, you could always uh, ask the RTO, the person who took the call, let them know when officers uh, complete the call, have them either call me on the phone or I'd like to meet with them in person. That's something that I'd like to do just for the fact that a radio call was generated and uh, we addressed the issue. So um, another issue was that Hargis call. I, I know I spoke to the the – the gentleman, he's the manager of the storage off of uh, Hargis and Venice, I believe it was. Um, we talked about no trespass signs, no trespass. And uh, that area, it's it's private pro property, so they have to place uh, no parking uh, signs as well. So we were able to get that done. So as you've noticed, that area has got cleaned up. Um, I've also gave notices and warnings to all the transients that were in the area. So uh, that actually got cleared out. Uh, little by little, all those ve vehicles, I believe there's one other vehicle that's inoperable, but um, I'm just waiting on management to notify uh, tow so they can get that vehicle out of there. But uh, also, like Officer Ragsdale stated, uh, in regards to any of the transients, uh, related crimes, encampments, so on, we're working with uh, our narcotics vice 
any surveillance uh, details that go over there and collect information on how we can resolve that issue. And, uh, you know, I, I know it's a nuisance, but it's something that we have to deal with. Uh, in the meantime, we're working on something to actually clear it out, you know, make, make livable. So uh, I think that's pretty much all I have is now. Okay, and uh, you know we'll talk more about the homeless encampments, but uh, be, any LAPD thing from Lori? I have a question from Bela. Well, okay, Bela go and then Lori next. Okay, um, so I was wondering, do you have any update on the, the fire, the, uh, the criminal activity at 9041 West Pico Boulevard? There was a huge commercial fire. Do you have any information on that fire? Uh, yeah, if you don't mind. Uh, this is Chris Ragsdale. Uh, no, at this point, I know that is being investigated by the uh, LAFD arson. Uh, mm -hmm. I haven't heard, I've, I've heard rumors, I'll say so, but nothing confirmed. But uh, I know that is being investigated by the fire department. Okay, great. Thank you so and much. I, had I, can, I can reach out and try to get a response from the arson squad uh, on any more details we can share on that. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, Lori, you're up. But you have to unmute yourself, Lori. Sorry, thank you, Mike. No I just wanted to mention that now that you guys have chased the homeless out of wherever, they are now living in Rainier Park. Uh, last night, we attempted to get the police out here to deal with it, and they said they will not respond because of COVID, which seemed very strange to me. But we have the police come out. Now we're calling because, you know, besides being in the park after hours, they're drinking in the park the whole day and, and passed out. And, you know, they go back and forth to the bathroom, so who knows if they're doing drugs. First it was one, now there's like seven people. They don't have a huge encampment. Uh, I have called the council office. I've called the LAPD. I called the park rangers. And other people in the neighborhood have also noticed this. And I don't know if you guys heard about the gentleman yesterday who ended up tearing up a front yard on Olin Street. I had seen the gentleman. He was a, a African-American gentleman talking to himself karate kicking in midair. The guy's been around here forever. Um, screaming obscenities at people in the park. And I thought about calling the police and I thought, well, you know, the police don't want to deal with the crazy people. I mean, there's really nothing you can do until they commit a crime. And then I heard within the next 10 minutes, he tore up somebody's front yard and broke everything in it. So I know we're trying to quote, reform the police what do we do when we see crazy people who so haven't is, yet committed a crime? So this is Chris Ragsdale again, and I'll go ahead and cover that. Uh, the homeless issue as a whole is a very complex and complicated uh, situation, and which uh, has mostly been removed from uh, the police services. So. The police department, no, it's no longer a police issue uh, to deal with homelessness. Whose uh, issue got, is it though? I'm gonna that. get into all that. Okay. Um, so we have the Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority. There is a law enforcement arm out of sanitation, the watershed division, that are the ones that are primarily trained to deal with homeless encampments. So years ago, LAPD was even removed from that aspect due to a lawsuit and court injunction. And as a result of that lawsuit, uh, only specific, specifically trained individuals from the city are able to process homeless property and sanitize and do what needs to be done. So we've been kind of removed. In order for me to go into an encampment, I've got to get a search warrant. If I want to re, uh, seize any property, I've got to do the same, get a search warrant or have probable cause of a crime or that that aspect was involved in uh, a crime. So that's where we're at with that. Uh, the COVID crisis has kind of complicated all this because uh, essentially most of the city services now are not dealing with homeless encampments. So we're pretty much, we have this issue at many of our parks 
I can tell you my former area that I used to work in, Westwood Park, this is a significant issue. And nobody's really responding from the city right now because of the COVID crisis. LAPD could only go in there and do very specific enforcement, not related to the, the aspects of the homelessness itself. So well, we, will get, we will get involved when somebody is either engaged in specific criminal activity, they're assaulting people, they're robbing somebody, uh, things of that nature. We will also, or drugs, and that's what we're having our narcotics, uh, as Officer Bermudez mentioned, that our undercover people are looking at those things. We can address drug use and drug sales. So we are looking at those things. Uh, the other aspect we can intervene on is if somebody's having a mental health crisis and they're posing a danger to themselves or others. And that, that would be a 911 call. So if somebody is having a mental health crisis, that would warrant calling 911 and giving the dispatcher the specific information and then they will code the call and prioritize it based on the information you give. Uh, but this is a very difficult issue. I live in the city, not far from the area, uh, dealing with the same thing. I'm, you know, it, it, it is a very difficult situation for us right now. Very complicated because of COVID. So even though we have signs that say the park is closed at 1030, and even though there's a law that says people cannot sleep in their car right next to a park or within a block, we can't do anything about this. In terms of the homelessness, yes. There's very little recourse right now we have. Normally we would do a process of outreach, uh, warning, notification, all the things that were required to do by the city attorney's office for them to file a case. And then once we did all that, we would take enforcement action and then have the proper departments either you know, process the encampment, remove or dispose of property, or bag tag and store it. That's all done through the sanitation department. But because, once again, because of the COVID crisis, none of that is being done right now. So we're all, in terms of, I can't say we're all, in terms of the police department, we're acting independently right now, just addressing what we can address on our end. Uh, we're happy to support the other city departments uh, once they resume their piece of the puzzle on this. Thank you, Lori. Bela. Hi, um, I just wanted to know if anyone is aware that CD5 has announced its um, uh, bridge housing for homeless in CD5, which will be right on La Cienega at the old Grand Motel on Cascio and La Cienega. And let's hope that they put our people, our homeless community in there. I don't know where they're gonna, but just, I didn't know if anyone was aware of that. I don't know if anyone from the council office is on this call. No, okay, anyway, that's it. Actually, Martin. Uh, hey, yeah, Bela, hi. Um, yeah, actually, there was a meeting today um, discussing this, and we're going to be putting it on our board's agenda for our next month's meeting. So if you tune in then, you can learn more about it, um, or we can uh, connect offline later, and I'll give you some more um, details if you'd like. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, any other questions for LAPD? Linda, go ahead. Uh, hi, for, for Officer Bermudez, um, the issue that you were referring to about the broken down car, just so you know that the public storage has posted signs of tow away, but the vehicle is still there. So I just want to give you an update on that. Correct. Uh, I drove by there yesterday and I spoke to the gentleman that's actually staying in the vehicle and uh, I've warned him again. Uh, so I let him know, and because that's private property, now that goes back to the, the public storage. So now what the public storage needs to do is pretty much contact the tow service and have that vehicle towed. Uh, I spoke to the manager, I believe it was uh, Mr. High, Stephen High, um, and uh, he was advised any vehicle that's parked there without their consent, that could be towed, and it's going to be towed at owner's consent. And I've advised uh, Mr. Montgomery, that's the name, the, the gentleman that's in, in the BMW that's been parked there. I advised him that his vehicle will be towed, whether he likes it or not. But at this point, it's up to the storage, uh, uh, public storage to make the phone call. Because that's 
private property and they need to make notification. We can always stand by for when it gets towed, but for the most part, yeah, we just stay there to keep the peace. It's up to them to actually get it towed because it's on their property. Gotcha. Thank you. No Thank problem. You. Any other questions for LAPD? Going once, going twice, three times. Okay, cool. We'll move on to the next agenda. And if you guys could stick around, because you probably can chime in on the uh, couple of uh, the, whatchamacallit, um, agenda items coming up. Okay, so let's see. I don't think we have anybody, or we don't have anything from the city attorney this week. So I, I'm assuming that there's nothing new on 8755 West Olympic unless LAPD has something or Bela has something. Either of you? Yes, no? Okay. Yes, I'll uh, take that. Okay. Uh, I have been out there since I returned from my uh, vacation uh, in uh, early July. Um, that has been mostly resolved in terms of the problematic behavior. Uh, I, am, I, I am aware that there are still some people in the building that live there, but pretty much our calls for service to the building have, has pretty much ceased where prior uh, to June, uh, we were getting calls there sometimes not only every day, but multiple times a day uh, dealing with issues. So that's stopped. Uh, I've spoken to the people that tend to be managing that situation and they have indicated that they have control of it now and that they are working on eventually uh, uh, clearing out the building. But I think it's the individuals that are there are being cooperative and they're working with them on getting new housing or relocating. Awesome, thank you. All right, uh, next up on the agenda, let's see. So emergency preparedness, uh, we don't have anyone from LAFD or CERT. So disaster resiliency, anything, Bela? Uh, hi, no, unfortunately with the pandemic, you know, emergency um, management department is not really moving forward on that although i still do encourage people in their on in their building or on their blocks to start some kind of communication i chose whatsapp um, and we have a group of neighbors that i've been encouraging in crestview and in beverly wood to create whatsapp groups for their emergency communications among their their neighbors awesome and uh, keep in mind that even with COVID, there is always the chance of an earthquake. We've had a few minor ones in the area as a good reminder that we could have a major one anytime. And that's, you know, we got to be ready for that and know what we're doing. So I urge everybody, like Bela said, to, you know, individually prepare, but as groups, we really need to start preparing for that. And I would like to in the next several meetings, uh, start tackling some organization in that regard. Um, any questions on emergency preparedness? Cool. In that case, we'll move forward. Um, okay, so on to COVID-19 activity in the South Robertson area. Okay, so basically, let me see if I can share the screen here. Well, let me get this. I want this and I want that. And I want to share screen. And bear with me while I find out where it's at. Okay, let's start with hospitalizations. All right, so this is a running chart of the um, daily new hospitalizations. The uh, second column, since you can't see the legend on this, obviously the first column is the dates. The second column is a running total of total number of daily admittance. So you can see how many people have gone through the hospitals since the uh, COVID began. And then the third column is each individual day's new patients admitted with COVID. Now the final column, which is the most important, is a seven-day average. Because reporting is very uneven, 
a seven day average is the best statistical way to figure out exactly kind of what the situation actually is. And as you can see, we started going up um, uh, from the beginning of July to where we peaked somewhere in the neighborhood of July 19th fish, which was my birthday. So there you go. And then, oh, actually, July 23rd. Happy birthday. Well, thank you. But July 23rd was where we peaked, and then it's been coming down since. And right now, we're roughly at 115, give or take. Uh, probably within the next several days or so, we should drop down below 100 on a moving average. And then if I can somehow get there, oops. Nope, that's not it. Um, hang on. This screen keeps coming into the way. Okay, there we go. So now here's cases in our area. And this kind of shows us um, basically the total number of cases to date. Uh, note that Crestview also encompasses all the way up to the Beverly Hills border and all the way across La Cienega to Crescent Heights. So it takes part of Faircrest Heights um, in that area. Uh, so it looks pretty inflated, but it's a very large area and it has several nursing homes where they had a lot of cases and deaths. Beverly Wood likewise extends all the way up to the Beverly Hills border. So it's more than just Beverly Wood. Um, Region Square is what we now call Helms and Rainier Village pretty much is true to what it is. Although a couple of the streets are part of La Cienega Heights, um, which is called Cadillac Corning on here. So that gives you the lay of the land. And then of course you can see our surrounding areas as well, right here. And everyone can see this, right? Okay, good, I see nods. Okay, and then, oh, back to the hospitalizations. I have a nice little chart here. You can see the charts? Not if you can see charts, no. Okay, hang on just a second. Uh, new share. And sure, there we go. Now you can see charts. Okay, so this gives us a good idea. Now the daily increase, you can kind of see the chart there. So that's all individuals, but this is a better idea of how things are going. And it shows you a good slope on, on hospitalizations and where we had the uptick uh, around the 6th or 7th of July where it skyrocketed up a little bit. And that's why they, the health department was all worried at that point and kind of freaked out. It was because they saw this large spike which ended up going higher than where we had been before. And so that was the reason why there was the lockdown, or well, I won't call it lockdown, but uh, reclosing a lot of the businesses and bars and restaurants and just kind of dialing things back. I forget, dimming the switch, I think is what they called it. But that's the reason why. Now, as you can see, it's kind of come down a little bit. We've had a little bit of a rise, but that should come down very shortly. And hopefully soon we'll be back down to where the levels we were before. Now, the one thing that we should mention is when you flatten the curve like this, you lengthen the event statistically. So what that means is that even though things are flat, COVID is going to be with us for a long time. And basically the precautions that you feel you need to take to prevent yourself and your family from uh, contracting the disease, you should listen and you know follow your heart, follow the science and do what you need to do to protect yourself. Alrighty, so let me take that off. And uh, does anyone have any questions? Nope, cool, we can move on. I just wanna say thank you for doing all that work. Oh, no problem, my pleasure. I like doing graphs and charts and things. <laughs> Anyways, uh, moving on to item D of unfinished business. Um, 
In the past a couple of meetings, we've been looking at identifying organizations that promote or administrate uh, programs to the disadvantaged communities and communities of color that would be eligible for neighborhood purpose grants. And so far, um, I think we've identified a couple, however, in reaching out to them, have not responded. And then we've also reached out to a couple and found out that they're not 501c3s, so took that off the list. So um, we don't really have any to discuss tonight, but if anybody has any uh, organizations or programs that do or could uh, promote uh, those types of programs, especially here in Soro, um, definitely please get them to me. Bela. Uh, did anyone reach out to the organization that uh, our Officer Baker referred? And we were talking about me, I didn't have time this month, but, um, and, and having them possibly do something in our area? Uh, reached out, but uh, haven't gotten a response. Um, it's possible, you know, when you reach out to an organization that you're not reaching out to the right person, or there's another email that's better. I don't know, but as of right now, no, uh, we haven't heard anything back. And normally I would have followed up, but uh, I've been kind of a little bit busy over the past couple of weeks. Sorry. Okay. In the roller coaster. Well, um, well, we can revisit that for next month. Okay. Yeah, so we'll, we'll, again, push that forward. We'll still reach out. And like I say, if anyone has any organization that they want to add to the list, please do so. Okay, yeah, and uh, by email is the best way to get that to me. Um, everybody should have my email, email address. If you don't, it's publicsafetychair at soronc.org, or you can type my full name, Michael Lynn, at soronc.org. Okay, moving on. New business. Um, we wanted to discuss the uh, possibility of forming a working group to reach out to businesses, nonprofits, and individuals in the Pico Robertson area to implement a security network that would include trained security patrols and security camera networks, among other things, in coordination with LAPD to make the area as safe as possible. And for this, I'm gonna turn the introduction over to Mark Silverman. Can you, can you hear me? We can. Great, great. I'll even put a video on. <clears throat> Good evening, everybody. Um, <clears throat> I, I've been discussing with Michael the last several months as well as, as well with uh, Jonathan Brand and Susie Markowitz and others <clears throat> about the possibility of uh, putting together a security network <clears throat> along the Fairfax and, and, uh, and Robertson corridors because of the upsurge in hate crimes uh, throughout the nation and in uh, our local areas, Cal uh, Southern California and LA as well. <clears throat> and uh, Recently, of course, there's been unfortunate uh, circumstances where uh, there have been some hate crimes and desecration of one of the temples along La Cienega during the, uh, the protests uh, about a month or two ago. Uh, so I think that uh, if we could put together a, uh, a working group to reach out to all of the businesses along those two corridors, as well as the nonprofits, uh, temples, other, religious organizations and schools. I think it's uh, very important for us to work with the LAPD to try to coordinate some type of security network to complement the LAPD because they can't be everywhere all of the time. And God forbid that we have some type of uh, uh, lunatic come into the area and try to, to disrupt the area in terms of uh, a violent um, or nonviolent uh, act, I think it would be uh, imperative for us to uh, think about trying to put together some type of uh, working group to reach out <clears throat> to these uh, businesses. I tried to do it myself. Susie helped out as well as Jonathan, but you know we really need a wide outreach from the community to, to do so. It's hard for two or three people to do it by themselves. Bela? Hi, Mark. Uh, my name is Bela Rahm. Um, that's great. I'm really happy that you're doing that. I don't know if you're aware that there's only my video on. Hang on. 
Um, there's already some people in the community that have been working on this with LAPD. So perhaps we can speak offline, unless you already know about that group. No, I spoke briefly with, uh, I'll tell you who it was, on my first meeting when I met uh, Michael, uh, I think it was Officer, um, originally Officer Kirby, who's no longer with. Uh, West LA. West LA, right. Yeah, he moved on, but uh, he, he, he thought that it was a, a really great idea to uh, try okay, to so it together. Okay, so it is a great idea, and there's actually a lot of people already working on it, and we already have a working relationship with LAPD, but we can talk offline about that. Well, actually, that's kind of what we're doing here is forming a group so that you can do that under okay. our umbrella. So, um, uh, Bela, besides you and Mark, does anyone want to uh, be on that working group? I know Jonathan was very- uh, Well, I'm within this committee. Yeah, yeah. Um, anybody that's here within this committee? Larry? I'm sort of. Uh, if somebody, excuse me, if somebody gives me a list of who they want me to call and and the idea of, I mean, I kind of know the idea. If you give me a list of who you'd like me to call, and I'm happy to make some phone calls. Okay, that's great, Lori. Thank you. I'll be in touch. Okay. So, I'm anyway, so, um, <laughs> real quickly, is there any anyone else that would want to be a part of that? Can I make a comment? Uh, sure, go ahead, Rick. Okay, so we actually have been kind of pushing that on the days that uh, Lisa and I, right now, we're kind of limited to uh, uh, people that are doing the community patrol 65 and under, so that's really cut our numbers at least in half. Um, but we actually do that, especially on special events, special holidays, and on times uh, of need. Um, I know last week we did the whole Pico Corridor uh, door to door. So it is something that, you know, obviously with this, with the slows with Chris and soon to be Jose, uh, they have us on those assignments on the days that we do work. Um, so there's kind of one already with the LAPD, obviously um, not with the general public, but with the LAPD where we have a car radio uniform and we do stand out somewhat. Right. Okay, did you want to join the committee or I mean this working group or no? No, I've, I've got, <laughs> yeah, I, was I still have a regular job too. Okay, so, yeah. either either officer, either of you, should anything to add? And who should be our contact person for this? Do we? I heard somebody mention Officer Kirby. I'm not familiar with an Officer Kirby from West Los Angeles area. Old news. He's old, old, old. Oh, Unless okay. you're Officer Kirby. <laughs> We're working with the captain, and so the captain's still on vacation. So we'll, we'll he's back now, Captain. Oh, yeah. oh just returned. Yeah. Okay. So we'll let him get into the swing of things and I will introduce um Mr. Silverman and his other people that are want to be involved to that um whole thing. Okay. Well, do we wanna do either of the slows want to be the contact or captain should remain the contact or I, I could be a contact actually. Make me the contact. Okay, and great. Then I go yeah, off that's a good idea. That's a great idea. Thank you so much. Okay, so uh, for the sake of brevity, let's, uh, I'd like to motion uh, to form an actual working group or subcommittee. I'm not sure which the proper term is that we need to meet uh, legally, but whichever one it is, I'll work that out um, with Martin. <laughs> um, actually, you know, if, either way, to form a working group or subcommittee with the purpose of um, reaching out to businesses, nonprofits, and individuals in the Pico Robertson area to implement a secure network, um, including possible training security patrols and security camera networks in coordination with LAPD. Okay, so with that being the motion, do I have a second? Um, I, I need a voice. I can second that. Bela. Bela got it. And okay, um, all committee members in favor of that raise their hand. Okay, so we got one, two, three. Um, or in your case, uh, Shana, use your voice. Shana, is that a yes or a no? Okay, well, I can't hear Shana. 
and we don't have chat, unfortunately. Um, so. Hey, Michael, would you like me to do a roll call for you? Um, based on what I can see in front of me. Uh, sure. Um, well, the committee members would be myself, Lori, Bela, uh, you'll see Shana as, as Frog STG. And that's it, because Rich, Rich is gone. Hmm. So Michael, actually, can you? Oh, there we go. Shana, are you a yes or no? So my sound is bad for the past like five, ten minutes and very like echoey and buzzy. So can you just tell me? Uh, I just walked outside so I can hear. Can you tell me what the issue is? We're forming a working group to um, uh, basically um, forming a working group to reach out to businesses and nonprofits and other individuals in Pico Robertson to uh, make a secure network in coordination with LAPD. Okay, so is that why I was hearing Rick talking, but is that why they were coming from business to business like about a month ago or so? Well, this would be, this would be a working group under uh, us that would involve whoever is currently working out there right now. So far, she, um, Mark Silverman, Bela, and Lori would be on the group. And if um, you want to join the group, you can. This is just a vote to make, to make it official. It's not related at all to what Rick was doing with the police officers when they were coming from business to business? No. no. Okay. All right. Well, I mean, yeah, I'm for that. Yes. Okay. So then I guess we have four to zero. Michael, is, is that something we this group can piggyback on? The, the business um, to business? As far as I'm going to leave that here uh, for you guys to discuss offline, you'll form your own meeting. Um, uh, what I'll do is I'll make a little um, introductory email for with the committee or working group, I should say, with the three of you on it on the email and then you can all have each other's contact information. And then you can take it from there and if you wanna talk to Rick, uh, I'm sure he'll answer your call. Maybe. And, and also can you bump CC um, Officer Ragsdale? Oh, of course, yeah. Of course. Okay, fantastic. Okay, so let's move on to item B. All right, now the next two came in. Uh, these are basically going through LANC, which is the um, overall, uh, basically a comp where representatives of all the neighborhood councils chime in on different things. And these are two items that uh, Terrence Gomes had presented as being part of that to run through us. Now, unfortunately, I don't have any background information other than what is here. And I'm going to share the screen so you can read these two. Um, we're dealing with B first. And share screen. Come on, share screen. There we go. Takes a minute to go through. Okay, so we're dealing with item B. Now, with instead of reading the whole thing to you. Um, well, I, I could actually uh, expand upon it, Mike. If oh, you you're here. Yeah, I'm here. You let me in, finally. Uh, I was a little, I was late. I'm sorry, I apologize to everybody. I was late. I got caught up with work. So, you know, we're actually doing that once in a while now, going back to work. So. Um, okay, Terry, take it away. Okay, anyway, uh, Department of Neighborhood Empowerment in, in uh, collaboration with the mayor's office did a survey of neighborhood councils. And if you see there where it says, Sur I can't click on it. So um, I'm trying to click on it, Mike, where it says survey. But yeah. anyway, uh, what it does is it shows the survey that neighborhood councils had taken. And what that survey showed was that they want a, as you can see the option three, they want a community assistance liaison team. They want to take basically the homeless and other disputes that don't require police uh, intervention to actually move it over to a third option. We've talked to the mayor about this. He thought it was absolutely great. Um, and then also there's an assembly bill, uh, AB uh, 2054, which is actually by our local assembly member, 
who uh, is giving grants for emergency service uh, responses. And what we do is have it where when you call 911, there's three options. One is police, two is fire EMS, and three is the community assisted liaison team. Uh, also that they found when studying the 911 system that because LAPD's not, because let me take a step back. When you call 911 and you need emergency medical services or the fire department, it first has to go through the Los Angeles Police Department's uh, switchboard, who then turns around and then transfers it to a Los Angeles Fire Department dispatcher. And with either heart attacks or any kind of medical emergency, it actually lengthens the response time. So by using options one, two, and three, um, you could immediately hit one for police if you need police, uh, two for fire, and the third option for community assistance liaison team, which is also what the county supervisors is talking about also. And what it does is it speeds up the 911 process because now not all calls are going through uh, the LAPD uh, operator. So it could actually speed up response times. And looking at what the survey was and also the money that's available through the grant program of the assembly bill, this would be a great thing for the city of Los Angeles to merge towards. Because then it offers more, when you need police, you'll be able to get to the police faster. When you need the fire department, you'll be able to get to them faster. And then when you need LASA or, or social work or whatever it is, you can press three. And that's okay. basically it. Thank you. One. Any technical questions for Terry? Uh, Lori, yes, go ahead. Lori. When can we start pushing three and actually get a response from somebody? Uh, well, if they do the program and actually do the part of the grant program is if you take the grant money from the state, you actually have to set it up. So it would be as soon as it rolls out, you would have that option. Okay, and when and, is the assemb assembly bill going to be voted on? Uh, very soon. It's already gone through committee. It's already gone through budget or whatever they call it up in Sacramento. And she's pushing it real hard uh, to get it passed. And, okay. and, it, and, and it puts less uh, work on actually the Los Angeles Police Department because now they're not going out for calls. That would be a loss of call or, or, you know, homeless issue. And that's where that would help. Oh, hi, Elisa. How are you doing? Thank you, any, Terry. Uh-huh. Any okay, other questions any other... about it? Uh, how about the PD? Uh, Chris, what do you think? Yes, actually, you are correct. Uh, all 911 calls uh, go directly to the Los Angeles Police Department. So they then have to screen for medical and then transfer it. And, and it does cause a little bit of a delay in that uh, reporting. So absolutely it sounds good if you know as long as all the right people are in and coordinating it it sounds like a good deal to me mm -hmm. well my understanding is that it'd, it'd be uh facilitated through uh ita which actually does the systems now so they would be coordinating it and then working with uh, los angeles county and the city lasa and all the other agencies that would be involved with that they would now have to have 24 hour response time for that. So yeah, they would have to commit to that. And I'm sure the city wouldn't want a liability by committing to it and then not having resources for option three. But, e but even if they go to option one and two, that still speeds up EMS time. Yeah. And there and was an, oh, go ahead, Chris. I'm sorry. I well, I was just going to say the only complexity that this is going to, you know, working out the details on this is going to be, uh, option three is going to include county as well as city or, or as well as state agencies mm -hmm. that are going to have to be involved with it. Exactly. Um, you're absolutely right. And there was an article in the LA Times and also in City Watch where people had actually tried calling the fire department to get a med, uh, medical services and it took them 20 minutes because of the, the amount of calls that were being generated going through the Los Angeles Police Department's dispatch to then be transferred, that this would be a good option to speed up uh, fire response time. Absolutely. Right. I have a question. Well, actually, Bela. Yes, Bela. <clears throat> Bela, hang um, on. Rick, Rick was up first. Oh, I'm oh, sorry. 
<laughs> I'm sorry, he wasn't unmuted, so I didn't think he was saying yeah. anything. No, 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 I put I my hand up. I didn't hand. want to I'm sorry. That. Well, I don't yeah. see a um, hand up. Okay, you do realize also for about the last year, uh, 911 has also had the ability to do uh, texting 911. Um, so that's also another option, if especially if it's an emergency where you're barricaded, let's say in a closet or somewhere where you can't talk, you can also text, but it does go through. If you can talk, they will want you to uh, dial in. Uh, but I've used it once before uh, where I couldn't, uh, you know, make too much noise. Yeah. Chris, can you respond to that, actually, how that texting works? And is it really efficient? And does it get the same priority as a 911 call directly with a dispatcher? I would have to actually consult with our communication center to see exactly how that works. But I, in, in what Rick Solomon was just saying, uh, I can see the benefit in that is if you did have a medical emergency and you were waiting on hold with 911 again, you could actually, I would, that would be something I would definitely try in the meantime is to, uh, mm -hmm. you know, text that medical emergency in and hopefully get EMS responding so you're not sitting on the phone for 20 minutes waiting for an operator to pick up. Does that I, go I can through? tell you this okay, much. Can I just ask one question though, Rick, before you go on? Yeah, uh, go Chris, ahead. does it actually go to... LA Fire, because I'm not aware that we're accepting it at LA Fire for texting. Yeah. Well, no, but it, it, it would go to our, the switchboard at communications. And, you know, I, I, I want to say that they would receive that separately from 911 calls, but I don't know that they line that up in the queue with all the other callers or if they would get mm -hmm. that more immediately, because obviously you're going to have a lot less text uh 911 calls than you do voice 911 calls so i i would presume that would co be expedited but i i need to follow up with our communication yeah. division i can have an answer for you at the next meeting great well it sounds like uh, it'd either be a great cpap well we could actually do a field trip right now but it sounds like it'd be a great thing at cpap to have a representative and it's kind of going offline but uh saying that having somebody from uh, 911 communications, the supervisor come in and explain all that at CPAB. That would be a great idea. Maybe we could uh, talk to the captain about having that happen. I'll throw that out there for sure. All right. Thank you, sir. Yeah, Rick. Okay, just to follow up, I've, I've actually been to the communications on four different occasions with uh, the Community Police Academy that I've taken, you know, multiple classes with. Um, basically, they have, I think they're up to six computer screens per terminal now. And, um, the, the, night, the, the text actually is very efficient in a sense that it goes right onto their computer screen. So it's not like you have to wait to, uh, typically for a phone to be picked up. Mm -hmm. It goes right on their screen. Like I said, if it's, if it's something you can talk, they'd rather have a talk than to start typing because they do have six right. screens in front of them. Uh, but it does work. And, um, you know, it's really used, like I said, for more emergencies where you might not or when the phone lines are completely packed, text is less bandwidth and it might actually work pretty good. Yeah, well, that's why we're saying though with the with the three options okay. also, and uh, and then I always have to look at as board members, we always have to look at the the lowest denominator where what happens with the elderly who don't text. That's well, an issue. That's, we're we're, we're okay. using the options me, one, two, and three would work. Let me throw a question to Bela. Yeah, all right. Hi, um, I was always under the understanding that when you call 911 from a cell phone that it goes to CHP. That's actually incorrect unless you're within because the, they've actually narrowed it down to where we know that when we get 911 calls through the fire and they're on the freeway it's it's CHP who then routes it to LA Fire's uh, dispatch but they're pretty they, they have it really down to a science now. No when you call 911 like by your house Bela over an aerodrome uh, yeah. When you dial 911, LAPD uh, will pick up. Okay, so, great. If, if so on that as well. uh, that was, they changed that, I want to say, about 10 years ago, maybe give or take. And uh, But that was true. All cell towers at that end did go to, nine, uh, to CHP. Uh, they've now tied in those cell towers to the local jurisdiction. The only times that we run into conflict with that is if you're near a freeway because many of the cell towers near the freeway will go to CHP. But as long as you don't live near a freeway or near an adjacent jurisdiction, in other words, if you're on the border of Beverly Hills, there's a chance you could end up 
uh, with Beverly Hills dispatch as opposed to your own. It just depends on what cell tower you ping off of. All right. Um, all right, so what I would like to do is move this forward as a motion. Um, I'll bring it back up on screen because it's a little lengthy. Uh, share screen. Well, I'll move or second it however you want to do it, Mike. All right, so I'm moving, you're seconding. Yes, sir. And okay, so we're moving to have Sorrow NC, the Stock Corrupts and Neighborhood Council, request that the City Council create a new council file based on the results of recent done survey to develop and support alternatives to armed crisis response and AB, AB 2054 emergency services, community response grant program. Uh, this would include revamping the City of Los Angeles 911 system, the 911 system should have a call option so that there are three options, one police, two fire EMS, and three community assistance liaison team. Option three would be created to meet the demand for an alternative to an armed crisis response for homelessness, uh, domestic abuse, neighborhood disputes, and other quality of life issues. So any further discussion on the motion? Um, hang on, let me get off of this. So any further discussion on the motion? Okay, hearing none, uh, let's take it to a vote. Committee members, uh, I'll read off of you. Okay, so I'm yes. Um, Lori? Lori's a yes. Yes. Bela? Yes. And uh, where'd we go? Terry? Yes. And Shana. Yes. Okay, so five zero. No abstentions. Fantastic. Thank you, guys. Let's move on to number three. And let me bring back the share. Nope, where to go? It's one thing about Zoom is like where things were a second ago when you go to the share screen, now they're all over the place, so it's hard to find. Anyways, uh, this is item C, discussion of possible action for the Soro NC to request the city council create a new council file to provide for transparency for the reallocated 155 million that was defunded from the LAPD so that the neighborhood councils that represent the areas of the city in the Un underrepresented and areas with people of color be afforded the opportunity to weigh in on where those funds are allocated and how they are spent for the benefit of the community that are underserved. Okay, everyone got that? And Terry, go. Well, basically what we're concerned with, and this came, and we did this at length, uh, was that yeah they took 150 from, from 150 million from the LAPD. Well, what are they spending it on? There's no transparency. There's no saying where it's going, what programs it's going to do, what programs they're creating. So we want a full accountability of what they're actually going to be using this money for. Because if they're going to take it for public safety, we want to know what they're doing with it. And there were many community members from the South LA area and they were concerned too because they wanted to know what actual programs were actually going to be uh, funded and implemented, if any. So that, that was the basis around, around this motion. Any technical questions for Terry? Oh, and just another thing, uh, the mayor was at length uh, and he even stated something about it that he was concerned too where the money is going. So we got one ally out of 16, so. Okay, and Terry, did you want to move that forward? Yes, sir. Although Rick had his hand up. Rick, you need to unmute Rick, you got to unmute yourself. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> I'm okay, not good I at reading just lips. Comment. Just based on the fact that West LA, um, our division, uh, the West LA is 65 square miles. We are definitely underserved as far as with the amount of officers and the square miles that we have compared to all the other uh, jurisdictions. So I feel that West LA is underserved only because we've got such a huge area community that uh, we need to um, 
I would like to see more police brought in because of that. You know, even though our crime is low, we're, we're still the biggest uh, location of all the divisions. Well, this, this actually wouldn't be bringing in more police. This would be a transparency on where the money that isn't being spent on police is being spent. So that's what this motion would be about. Am I correct on that, Terry? Yeah, you're absolutely correct. Okay, so Terry moves it forward. Uh, anyone want to second it or if I'll not, second it. Lori. Okay, so now we can have a discussion on this. Anything we want to alter, anything we want to add, anything that we like it as it is. Can you Any put it up, Mike, so they can see it? Just in oh, case they want to change anything. Yeah, it's a, probably a good idea. Whoops. Okay, so there it is. Can you all see it? Now remember, Soro does contain areas that are underrepresented. So we would be getting money also into this area. And we need to know what that money actually is. Because it's just like Shenandoah is a Title I, so represented area. And also Hamilton. I think Hamilton is still a Title I too. So we would be seeing money coming back at least into our area. Yeah, Chris. Is his hand up? No. Oh, I thought your hand was up. I'm sorry, sir. He's just turning knobs and adjusting levers and switches and things. Okay, so does anyone uh, have any comments? Uh, or can we move the, or can we take this to a vote? I have a question. What is a council file? Okay, so council, uh, basically every uh, motion that goes to the city council, they create an actual file. And in that file, um, it tracks the progress of where that's at, what committees it's in, what the votes were, and it also allows for public comment to be attached to that council file. So that the, you know, uh, once the file's created, we as a neighborhood council or any other neighborhood council or any individual citizen can log a comment onto that particular file. Any other resident, Mike? I'm sorry. You, don't, you don't have to be a citizen to be able to comment. Oh, I'm on sorry. It. You're right. Council resident. File. Sorry. I was thinking citizen of LA, but yeah. Resident. And, of the, and, and then does the whole file go to the city council? The city council creates the file. Ah, okay. And then, then we can all weigh in on it. It, it provides the transparency for everybody it, rather than uh, numbers and figures just being done behind closed doors and then we find out about it after the fact. So it's actually the city council that's taking the money and then supposedly going to use it on these programs? Right, so this brings it out, of, out from the shadows into the light. Any other questions? I do. Is there any kind of oversight to this, or is it just it, the motion is only for a council file? Terry? I'm trying to understand the question, because so well, once a council file is open, because see, the way anything gets passed by city council, they have to have what's called a council file. So we're requesting them to open it up so that then there's transparency and then we could see where, where they're actually voting to put the money. So potentially. Or, or if they are, for that matter. Because it may be where a council office may just say, oh, we're going to take part of that money. And they could quite possibly without council authority. So that's why we're wanting it to be very transparent. And wouldn't the oversight be from the city controller? Uh, well, it'd be from everybody. Because it's out in the okay. open. It's a council file. We could see all the actions that are going on with the council as to when it goes to their committee, when it goes to uh, the city council itself for a final vote. And with a council file, we could actually be part of that process because then they would have to notice not only the public, but also the neighborhood councils upon this council file. So we're able to weigh in, we're able to write letters, we're able to take votes, we're able to have meetings with actually staff to be able to say, hey, wh where's our money for SORO? Because we have two Title I schools, and we have all these residents who fall under Title I and would be eligible for underrepresented areas. 
I think it would be helpful that there's notification and that there's actual voting going on. That, that's what I meant by the oversight. So, so thank yeah. you for the explanation. Yeah, and that's actually what we'd have. It would be fully transparent and you would see the votes, absolutely. Okay, um, any other comments, questions, views? Anybody? Awesome, okay, so not seeing any. Um, all right, so uh, yeah, let's take this to a vote. Again, this would be a motion, and this is for the people who aren't on, who are calling in, uh, which I think is just Ellen. Uh, we have a motion for the Soro NC to request that city council create a new council file to provide transparency for the reallocated 150 million that was defunded from the Los Angeles Police Department so that the neighborhood councils that represent the areas of the city that are underrepresented and areas of people of color with people of color be afforded the opportunity to weigh in on where those funds are allocated and how they are spent for the benefit of the community that are underserved. Oh, I just want to say one thing, Mike. When yeah. you see that language that says like underrepresented and areas uh, with people of color, all that came out of the initial uh, council file that defunded the Los Angeles Police Department. So we're using their technical language of what they're saying it is. So okay. if people are wondering, why is it worded like that? All right, thank you. So let's go to a vote now. Um, I vote yes. Lori? Yes. Uh, Bela? Yes. Uh, Terry? Yes. And Shana? Shana, one more time. Yeah. He's kind of a Did you say my name? I think he said yes. Am I he correct? said yeah. Did you say my name? He wants to know if you're voting for it. No, Shana said yeah. I said yes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I you. All right. Shana likes to talk in third person, huh? <laughs> okay. Next up on the agenda is discussion and possible action regarding safety issues surrounding the homeless encampments in the Garth underpass. Okay, so basically, um, we kind of touched on that earlier, uh, you know, um, LAPD, hang on, let me uh, switch back to me. Uh, Officer Bermudez and Ragsdale had uh, previously talked about what was going on with uh, homeless in general. Now we want to kind of specifically address what's happening in that Garth underpass. And that, for those of you who aren't familiar, this would be the area um, that Penn goes freeway. Under Penn Freeway that connects. Uh, basically, if you took Corning, it kind of dead end or in, it kind of continues on and becomes Garth under the freeway. So that's that. Um, uh, let me start with Terry so he can kind of bring up to date with the things that have been going on with uh, LA sanitation. And because uh, we've already touched on kind of how encampments are handled. But let's talk specifically about uh, what's happened under this one, Terry. Well, what I noticed was on next door that neighbors were getting zero response from the city of Los Angeles to have that area not only cleaned up, but the safety, the drugs, and also, as Rick had said, had stated numerous times on next door, that they're stealing water and power from the city of Los Angeles. Um, so when I saw that they weren't getting any uh, services, I immediately contacted sanitation, got no response from them. So I went directly up to uh, the, uh, the head of public works, the president, and then it all, you know, it all goes downhill. So then they responded and they immediately cleaned up. And part of what they were saying though was that the council office was using most of their cleanups in other areas and not doing it in Soro. So I got the cleanup done immediately. I also had them put up uh, no parking signs so that they could clean the area better by removing vehicles there and seeing what was there and not there. And they were supposed to also uh, facilitate the ADA compliance with the camps there, which my understanding they didn't do and I'm already discussing that with them right now. And I know some of the neighbors in that area want to see additional services. So what I was gonna write, and that's why I asked you to put it on the agenda is that we create a subcommittee to work specifically, because that's the, 
that's the most troublesome homeless encampment we currently have in Soro because the one that's on Venice Boulevard under the 10 freeway is outside of our boundaries. So we can't, we can't go try to rule another country from our country. So we can only do our area for now. And I will be working with Pico NC and also uh, mid city. We'll get right to you, Lori. Um, well, actually, Elisa has a first hand oh, up. Oh, I don't see her. Sorry. <laughs> oh, okay. I, I see Lori. So anyway, so that's what we're trying to do is create a subcommittee so we could discuss what needs to be done and actually get it get it done. What would be equitable, not only for the people who are homeless, but also for the community to make sure it's safe and clean and uh, that we do that. Okay, Elisa. Hi, thank you so much, Terry, for helping us. As Michael knows, as you know, we have had this issue with the Garth Hunter Pass since I joined the Rania Village Neighbor Association 12 years ago. And there was a dumping of illegally items. There was parking of RVs, the same in the Cataraugus underpass. And so now with the homeless, I understand what the police officers are saying. Their hands are tied unless there is a crime being committed. And street services, they, you know, they, they can't do anything. So whatever you guys can do, because the situation is really much worse than it ever was. You're absolutely correct on that. I know back in 2016, we also worked on, we got, or was it 2015? I'm trying to remember when we got the signs put up underneath the, uh, put up so that they couldn't park motorhomes there anymore. So that, that actually helped tremendously. Uh, we started getting uh, street uh, services, the investigators out there, and we were able to cut down on the illegal dumping because they did actually catch some people who were actually illegally dumping and were able to arrest them and prosecute them. So we've worked with that and that's why we don't see dumping anymore. Now we just see the homeless. And one of the things that we got to do with the subcommittee is also to educate the public that when they have a bulky item, they need to call 311. We got to put that out because people are not calling 311. They're putting it out front and then the homeless are coming by and picking it up and dragging it all the way to the underpass. And that's where we're getting all the bulky items that are being there. Actually, one guy actually found a refrigerator and actually has it operating over on, that's Beverly Wood, right, Rick? Yeah. Rick, yeah, yeah that, that's the single guy that's right around the corner from the underpass that is considered a Beverly Wood. So if you took Beverly Wood from Robertson, it kind of zigzags under the freeway and then parallels it on the south side. Correct. Right, and then we got also all the dumping that's right there at La Cienega and uh, Beverly Wood right there and also the, the yeah, on been, and off ramp too. That's yeah. been cleaned up quite a bit. I've made some calls on that. That's usually a handful of people and it gets cleaned up. That one actually does get cleaned up. Um, right, but, as but, of today, but, that wasn't bad. Right, but as soon, as soon as they do the cleanup, then they they haul the stuff again, and that's where we got to start educating the community on on the benefits of using three one one all the time. Hey, but Lori. what we really want to do is start a subcommittee out of public safety to actually focus on this issue. Okay, Lori. Uh, so you need to unmute you yourself. Sorry, I was just going to bring up the Cataraugus Tunnel and how how filthy it is and how people have been attacked as they walk through and it's our only corridor into Culver City and to the metro. It's not a safe place for our neighbors to walk. We could work on that also though. Chris, uh, Chris what, what, what do you, I know that's not your area, that's actually Chris Baker's area. Um, Which Jose is covering. Oh, okay, I didn't know that. Uh, real quick and I'll, I'll just throw this in, uh, just one thing to be a, for your situational awareness, and this is what I've experienced elsewhere. When we actually do, we're doing the full, uh, we used to call it Clean Streets LA, where they would literally post the area and remove everything. A lot of times what the homeless would do is they would relocate. So it was, it was more of a shuffle. Unless the homeless are actually going into housing from that point, they're just moving to another neighborhood or another area and uh, just becoming a, a different neighborhood's problem. So I just wanted to throw that, that out there for situational awareness because once things do start moving and you, you know, progress with this, we're probably gonna shuffle that problem or move it somewhere else. 
And I just wanted to add, I am aware and I know our undercover assets, both narcotics and vice, have uh, either made arrests uh, and issued citations at that specific encampment. And I'll let Jose add anything uh, that he wants to add. Okay, so, so that being said, uh, I work narcotics in West LA for about four plus five years. I just came back out to patrol. Uh, we did a lot of the the cleanups in the area. Uh, we would get notifications from the senior lead officers, and uh, they let us know the problem areas. So, like, say a lot of the tunnels, we would go out. I'd complete a task force. We'd go out. We'd get in contact with sanitation, our hope unit and uh, mental evaluation unit. Um, the problem that we have, or that we had, as we were going through doing the sweeps, we'd make multiple arrests, we'd clean up the sidewalks, but like, uh, like Officer Ragsdale was explaining, is they just shuffle them. They go into a different area. So what we try to do is offer them housing try to get them some type of shelter. A lot of times they refuse it. So that seems to be one of our biggest issues when we do that. Um, you know, we make an arrest for narcotics or whatever the reason be, they come back out to the streets and they know the area. So they stick around. So they shuffle around. So our, our biggest thing is for them returning. We'd like to get them permanent housing or get them some type of shelter, but it's very difficult to do when they refuse it. They do not want, I see a hand up. You got a question? Go ahead, Lori. Well, really, I guess what I'm wondering is if the government is thinking about opening up any more mental institutions, because by closing them, that was the beginning of this problem. And like you said, we're just shuffling homeless people. People who are mentally ill or on drugs are not gonna help themselves. Instead, they're affecting all of our lives by utilizing all the services. Yeah, whether it's, the whether it's sanitation. The court decision, uh, you can't commit somebody to a mental health institution either. They have to go willingly. Yeah, that, that being said, a lot of times when we when we end up going to court on a lot of the, especially drug charges, that's one of the recommendations that we usually speak to the, the, the DA and we'll ask, uh, is there any type of uh, program that they could do? So we try to get them enrolled in some type of uh, either housing or rehabilitation center. And uh, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But it, it's one of the options that we have and we, we offer a lot of the, the people we take into custody for narcotics charges. Um, but that being said, that those are the, those are the routes that we take. We'll, we'll put on some type of task force and uh, clean the streets. We try to get sanitation. That's the biggest thing. We try to get sanitation out there so they could pressure wash the sidewalks, the walls and clear passage for uh, people to, to commute or walk on. Is uh, that's one of the biggest concerns? Uh, any type of uh, it, it leads to diseases and infections. Um, they get sick. You know, public gets sick, so it, it's a concern for us. But uh, on top of that, it leads to crime. So that's why we try to work on some type of uh, crime enforcement in the area. Uh, after, like, say this this meeting. We'll get in contact with them. Let them know, like, these are the concerns. That's why these meetings are, are good. We get in contact with our uh, undercover units, any type of special uh, task force that we going on, that we have going on. We might be able to fo focus more on those locations. So that's where we'll probably go from here. Okay, Bela right. and then Jason. Hi. Um, you mentioned something about... Um, that a person who is mentally ill and homeless could only go into some sort of place if they voluntarily want to go in. Where are those places? Because I know homeless people who are mentally ill, one in particular, that was trying to his best to get into some place and there is no place for them to go. So if you have some information, you can tell me offline. I just wanted to mention that. And this could be something that the subcommittee can investigate. 
I've investigated it for the last four years. Okay, Jason, you have to unmute yourself and go ahead and unmute yourself. So sorry, I had to drop off the meeting earlier and then come back. So I may have missed something that was covered. Thank you to everybody who's offered so much great advice so far. Um, I don't know who this question is for, whether it's the officers or somebody in the community, but it, it sort of baffles me. And I'm not sure, quite sure how sort of everything that happens to be a crime is allowed to continue. So whether that's the flea markets on Venice or the drug activity in these underpasses or blocking of the sidewalk, like how do we, get, who needs to know about it? How does it need to be reported? How can it be addressed? Because I feel like if there were people running red lights left and right, you know, police officers wouldn't just pass by and allow it to happen. Um, but there's a lot that seems to just, you know, I see officers driving by these areas or, uh, or I see the cities driving by these areas and they're not addressing it. So who, what's the best way to get attention beyond obviously what we're doing now um, to make sure this, the right people are aware of what's happening? Well, okay, so let me start and then we'll throw it over to Chris and Terry. So it's actually a multi-prong um, answer to your question. So for um, obviously law enforcement, uh, you know, things that are illegal in nature like narcotics, uh, stolen merchandise, et cetera, um, LAPD would take care of that. Uh, sanitation is in charge of the making sure that they're, uh, they're not uh, encroaching on the ADA compliance space. Uh, Board of, uh, I'm sorry, Public Works for the theft of power and water. I mean, you got a whole bunch of different agencies all together. So let me throw it to Chris and then to Terry to kind of fill in the gaps of what I just broadly painted. Uh, yes, so that is uh, correct. Obviously, um, it's also uh, an issue of priorities. Um, there's certain, you know, a lot of things have been decriminalized. I do just want to highlight that. So uh, things like illegal vending has been decriminalized. Uh, so there's, you know, it, it, we're looking at a lot of things of just being a, an issue of priorities, as well as uh, many of the things that are occurring on the public right away fall under street use inspection. So we actually do have street use inspectors. They're, they're a law enforcement agency of themselves uh, within the city out of uh, street services. And they actually will go out and investigate these things as well uh, when there's these activities taking place on the public right away. And by the way, many of these can be reported via MyLA 311. Uh, especially the street services issues and the street use inspection services stuff. Hey, Terry, do you want to fill in anything or are we good there? Let me unmute myself first. Sorry about that. Uh, Chris, you're absolutely right. But part of the problem, though, is that we've been seeing where P residents are reporting it to my 311 and getting absolute zero response back. And that's where I stepped in and I mean, like I said, I got nothing from the local supervisor. I went directly to the public works president and excuse my language, but shit rolls downhill real quick. And I, I got a call within 20 minutes after calling public works. And I have a good relationship with public. I have a good relationship with a lot of uh, departments in the city and who's who and what's what, but we need to have it where it's not always me just calling, but to have the community come together and put pressure, not only on our city council members, but also on the departments themselves. Uh, it was just like when they came out to do a street cleaning uh, and um, uh, Michelle, Michelle Grant, correct, was her name, uh, had actually taken pictures where street service had pulled up, moved stuff from one truck to another, took off, and then said that the street was cleaned. Well, we hammered them and sent them all the pictures and hate to say it, some people in the city got in trouble because of it, because they're supposed to be doing their job and they weren't. Um, but currently though, if I'm not mistaken, there is a council file that actually passed that street vending currently is illegal during COVID-19 and that's not being enforced. That's actually had been uh, brought up by city council. So that's something we got to work with also on that. And I know like uh, what Jason was saying about the swap meets, the swap meets are being held 
not on private property, but on the public right of way. And that should be enforced. It's quality of life issues. And that's what we're seeing because we're not only seeing the fact that the trash and everything is there after they leave, but then also when people are coming down Venice Boulevard and they see the swap meet and they pull over block traffic and there have been a few accidents over the years that have been created because of it. And those are things with quality of life that we have to address and having a subcommittee to actually praetor, uh, pra, uh, Priority. Priority. Yeah, thank you. I'm tongue tied right now. But anyway, um, to see what we need to do and start hitting three items, get those three items done, then start on three others, then three others. Because one of the things with the homeless crisis, though, you know, we've been a big proponent to get it under wraps going all the way to 2015 when we told the mayor when there was only 13,000 homeless in the city of Los Angeles that they got to declare a state of emergency because it's going to explode. And here we are, 70, you know, 75,000 homeless in, in, you know, between the city and the county, and they've just let it go and haven't done anything. And then I understand, though, from Lhasa that Lhasa does have not only shelters, but also housing available, but the homeless aren't taking advantage of it. And I think that's what we got to push, though, because as Chris was saying, well, you shuffle them around, you shuffle around. If you keep shuffling them around every week, they're going to be finally like, screw it, I'm tired of this. I, I'll take housing. That's what happened in 2015 when we went down. Let me just finish this, Mike. Yeah. Um, uh, we went down because the VA was not doing its job to get the veterans off the street. We went down there. We found 100 veterans, took them to the VA over in West LA. 25 of them actually took housing that day. Uh, the others, they took services. They reconnected. We got uh, from the, uh, uh, they used to call them the Obama phone. I'm not sure what they call them now, but uh, we gave every veteran a telephone and that was able to connect them with the VA because now they, the VA was able to call them with their appointments, their test results and everything else that needed to be done. And we got a lot of people off the street that way uh, because it wasn't only the initial 25, but then the additional 75 started getting into the program and then started saying enough's enough. I'm tired of being at fifth and Gladys where it's a disaster down there and I want to be in housing and that's what they did. So it can be done. It's just, we have to get together and pool all our resources and start saying, what's a priority? What's our first three? Okay, so what, reason, I like do, what I'd like to do is cut Terry off <laughs> and actually propose that we, or motion that we form a subcommittee. But before I do that, I wanted to get a feel of who else would be on that subcommittee working group, et cetera. Um, so besides Terry, we got Rick, and uh, who else? Lori? Who else Nobody else? Uh, Jason, great. That, that's fantastic. Uh, okay, I'll help you, Bela. Bela. Right. And if you've got right. homeless people in your area, you ought to volunteer if you haven't already. Is Anyone this else? Any members only? No, nope. anybody. Yeah. We, yeah. Want, we want the community involvement, though, because I can make decisions, yeah. but I want to hear what the community has to say. And what they're, because what my priority may be over here in La Cienega Heights may be different for somebody in Helms or somebody in Crestview. So we need full input with it. Okay, so Melinda and anyone else? Do we have all their contact information, Mike? Uh, I believe I do. Terry, Rick, Lori, Jason. Jason, I, you're the only one who I don't know if I have contact information for. So, um, can you email me your contact information to um, Michael Lynn at sorrownc.org? Cool. And then, um, Lisa, are you going to be in on this or no? Um, no, but I'm the one who posted that next door item and I've been following it. And I posted many okay. other items through the years. Right. So and that, that's the one that, that caught my attention, though, was I'm what you communications posted. person. I was communication at Rainier Village Association. I'm the editor of the Rainier Village blog, so I will transmit information, but I can't. I'm actually too no old problem. to go out there myself. No problem at all. Okay. Michael, so, can I throw uh, someone on the committee that's not here tonight? Sure, let's do it. I believe Peter uh, Liff would, uh, would 
be more. He's right across the street from the park. He's very active. Okay, I think I have his contact information, but if yeah. not, I'll get it right. from... And then can I make a comment on the Gar thing? Um, real quickly, and then I'd like to move this. Yeah, I mean, my shop's right around the corner, so I drive by it all the time. Today at 5 o'clock, they were all pretty much congregated on the west side of the tunnel, um, and that's because that's where the power is compared to the um, east side. There was only one tent compared to probably 10 tents on the other side. Now they're getting power. Instead of getting it from the lighting on the um, north side, they're getting it from the freeway. There's kind of a, a breezeway. I'm not sure what that is. It's kind of like a um, green area on the south side of that overpass, and that's where they're getting power from now. Water I'm not aware of. I am not aware of water, but definitely power. And they're doing a good job of hiding right. it by uh, masking the, the, the cord and everything like that. Up. Right. You just have to follow the cords. That's all. All right. right. Well, it was the guy with the refrigerator who said he was going to start getting water. So I don't know where he was going because he wanted to get ice in the door for his refrigerator. Well, I mean, he can obviously, let's, if he has power, he can throw water me, in there. Uh, <laughs> Rick, Terry, let me just, let, let's, let's vote on this and get the committee for uh, I'm going to bring it forward. Do I hear a second? I'll second. Was that Terry? Yep. Okay. Any further discussion on forming this subcommittee or can we vote? Cool, let's vote. I'm a yes. Uh, that would be Lori is a yes. Bela? Yes. Uh, Terry? Yes. And Shana? Yes. I'm hoping that was a yes. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that was a yes. She's bouncing all over the place. And Mike, if you get me all their contact information, then we'll we'll look at probably uh, later of I don't next know who week. Just bouncing all over the place every time they take a vote. I come over here and I vote. I don't know if you can hear me. Yeah, I can hear you now. Yeah. We so got we'd, be okay. looking, we'd be looking like uh, at the end of next week to have our first meeting, just to so everybody can know who they are, share contact information, and then start looking at some priorities to set forth, and then we could tackle on what department actually needs to do it and get a hold of them and start doing it. And I mean, if we have to have weekly cleanups, then we have weekly cleanups. You know, that's what we need to do. And then I know some of the residents wanted to have possibly, you know, porta potties and showers. Uh, I could already see the same. I'm just letting you know well, what- Guys, guys, discuss it in your subcommittee. <laughs> no, but I just wanna let, I just wanna let know ahead of time what, what some of the, the requests have been so that's i just want to let everybody know what we're dealing with so we're going to let you guys do in the subcommittee and then one thing also in your subcommittee if you can put together is maybe um uh potentially some outreach that sorrow nc could fund whether it be a flyer or whatever uh ideas you have you know social media flyers etc so put that in your absolutely notes. and uh let's move on to the last item which is a uh, discussion of possible action regarding a homeless individual that threatens, that is threatening residents and the lack of, well, we had lack of response from LASA, but I don't know if response is the right word. Um, Melinda, that was you, right? That's correct. So um, it was an individual um, who has been verbally threatening um, near our residence and we've uh, notified LASA and they've responded and they offered the individual all the resources available including as you may know the project room key um, where he can have permanent, um, I mean, not permanent excuse me, but immediate access into a hotel or motel room that they can arrange him into and he pretty much said no I like it here I, I rather be here than go into the project room key um, and LASA a representative told us that sorry, pretty much nothing we can do. Um, if he refuses all services, which he did, then he can stay where he is. Um, which I think it's maybe part of that discussion about, you know, what can we do if somebody refuse services and, and say, I'm just gonna keep living in my car here um, and, 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 you know, clean into residents' backyard at 5 a.m., 3 a.m. in the morning on a weekday, um, you, you know, and, and he, you know, wants to be there and he is still there. So. And he's a, and he's a threat to the residents 
and several reports have been made about this individual. So again, now this person is showing to be threatening the neighbors and still nothing can be done. So let me- is, is, Can I ask one question? Is this the one that was on Hargis? Yes, sir. Okay, that was the one that you weren't getting response by Lhasa and I had to contact the mayor's office and they sent oh, out the- yeah, yeah, they sent out the person the next day after I called the mayor's office on it, so. Thank yeah. you for that and yes. Okay, yeah, so- I just wanted to make sure we're talking about the, the, the same incident. Let me bring in both Chris and Jose, or either or, um, to say, okay, so, you know, um, where, where is that line? Where can uh, either Melinda or other residents that, you know, feel like they're being threatened, where is that line where they should be calling and or shouldn't? And, you know, uh, beside, if, if Lassa can't do anything, uh, how do we prevent them from potentially jumping over the fence and going at, you know, like, where's that line? Uh, but we need you to unmute yourself. Well, sorry about that. Uh, it all depends on, uh, you know, once again, circumstances, because a lot of people will say uh, somebody's being threatening, but uh, they're not me meeting the elements of a crime. So sometimes their behavior or their actions are aggressive, but we don't actually have anything that we can pursue criminally. So that kind of ties our hands there. Now, if they meet certain criteria, we can take them for an involuntary hold, but they have to meet that criteria. In other words, basically display and show that they're a danger to themselves or others uh, for a mental health hold. Otherwise, we're looking at you know, criminal threats or aggravated assault, depending on what their actions are. But it's very difficult. Uh, and we have to have witnesses that are willing to come forward and not just call. So one scenario that we see frequently is somebody does have an incident, they call the police, but then they leave the scene or want no further contact or uh, uh, involvement. And then that leaves us with our hands tied because if a crime did occur, we, we're, we're going to need somebody to either uh, affect a private person's arrest, or if it's at the level of a felony, somebody that's going to be able to sign a crime report. I think part of the problem you face, in all honesty, is if I call the police, let's say because somebody in a gang was outside shooting, I don't want you to come to my door. The gang will then know I'm the one that contacted you. So I've offered up sorry about that i've offered up my phone number but i don't want the police to show up at my door then i'm going to be threatened yeah. no and i under completely understand that and we do run into that issue frequently so that is a common problem but unfortunately if we're going to be taking any police action uh that's what we're absolutely going to have some have to have somebody come forward i mean keep in mind that, that can easily escalate into a use of force that, uh, you know, we're going to be left holding the bag if everybody else abandons us. So we kind of need that person up front to sign something and say, oh, yes, I want to press charges. This person committed a crime. Uh, and then we're, I'm willing to prosecute. I've got no problem doing that. However, I still wouldn't want you to come to my front door. You know, if I show up in court, they don't know where I live necessarily. But, and again, I'm willing to leave my phone number for, to be contacted, and I am willing to go to court. But I still don't want people to know, especially if I'm complaining about someone breaking the law in a park 25 feet from my front door. And that is something, there, there are ways. It's a huge that. problem. You can meet the officers outside of your home uh, or, you know, Try Around to, the if, corner. Possibly, yeah. And that's something you can arrange when you call. You know, I'll have officers meet me at this location, uh, and then they can talk to you before they go approach the individual. So th those are all options, but it, 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 we do run into that issue quite frequently. Okay, thank you. Hey, go ahead. Do you want me to say something, Michael? Um, so, so just to add... I just wanted to chime in real quick. I, I just want to chime in on that. So like uh, Officer Ragsdale just stated, a lot of times a lot of people don't want to 
confront the person that actually committed the crime without the person actually pointing out the suspect to us as officers responding there we can't take that person into custody so like we talked about what you can do is uh, arrange to meet around the corner from the house uh and what we'll normally do we call it uh, a field show up we'll put you in our car so they can't see you we'll drive to the location and we just need verification by whoever the victim is to state that's the person they won't see you you could see them but they can't see you so that way we could pretty much go back complete a report stating you verified that's the person because we didn't see the person who did that to you so we just need verification on that and that way we complete our uh, arrest report and when it goes to court they don't know where you where you live a lot of times uh if the person's subpoenaed to go to court if not sometimes we're able to testify in uh, part for the victim just based off of uh, our video cameras that we have and just statements that are made to us uh but yeah that's really important a lot of like we said a lot of people they'll call something in but they don't want to stand by to uh either speak to us or uh get, yeah. give any further information just because they don't want to get involved so it's very important to even if we get a phone number so we can call you or have someone call you over the phone to get that information it's very important okay so bela and then terry I didn't have anything to say. You just unmuted me. I didn't know why. Oh, no, never mind. Then Terry, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to respond to that, what you were saying, Chris, and also Jose. When Captain Aborn Curry was captain of West LA, that's going back a long time, correct, Chris? So what we did, because La Siena Heights used to be called Corning, Ca uh, Corning Cadillac, and we were rooted to them, shoot them, drugs, prostitutes, you name it, we had it going on here. And the residents were scared to death to meet with officers because gangs were everywhere. And I met with uh, Captain Abor Curry and we developed a program where officers would then have 911 call back and get the contact information. And then just like Chris says, but the officers were already uh, being proactive to do that instead of walking up to the door and knocking on the door. And that was something that was very successful that we were able to clean up the area, reduce crime. And then that's when we changed the name to La, uh, La Cienega Heights. Um, and that, that was a, a big deal that really created confidence in the neighbors because they were scared to death that the gangs would come as soon as the PD left, that they would then be attacked. So I don't know if we got to try to implement that again, Chris, um, to, to have the officers that actually work our area that when there is something like that, that they do get a, get a phone, call back phone number and then call the person if they don't want to or meet elsewhere just so that they know that that could be an option. And and that is something that can, you know we would look to the council to probably put out and let the community know because that is something that we actually occurs now. It's basically just the person that's reporting the incident, indicating contact by phone only, I would like to meet with officers, but you know, away from uh, my residents. One thing I just want to clarify on this is, uh, in many cases, we won't meet the elements of a crime. So we'll say somebody will say, "Well, that person threatened me," and it doesn't meet the elements of a criminal threat. So somebody can say, "I'm going to get you." Just wait, watch your back. That is not a criminal threat. That is not a crime. Uh, it is scary. It's intimidating and it's not right. And we can still address that individual, but we lack the elements of a crime in that instance. Okay, so I guess my question to is kind of like an open question is, is that, um, is there something that we can do through the neighbor council to get this to be resolved? Um, I'm not sure if this is, I'm not sure if that's a question for LAPD, for Terry. Bring it to uh, our subcommittee and we will handle it 100%. All right, but we gotta so, get somebody, whether it's PD, whether it's mental health services, um, put okay, pressure so, on them to take the, you know, is right, he on I, public property or is he on private property? Cause I wasn't sure where he's actually located. Canada? 
He's on private property. He is on in the parking spots for the, um, the public storage, the extra space public storage. And the storage just put out signs today about towing. So I can get in contact with them tomorrow um, to see if they can call the towing company and come and take care of it because his car is inoperable. It's just basically, you know, a shell for him to live in. But I just want to say that um, Officer Bermudez has really helped us out tremendously. He's he came on patrol without me, without us even calling him. Um, and he went to talk to the public storage, you know, unit. And really we alerted the council district and thank you, Terry, for helping us out. Um, but I think that the question remains, if they don't want help from LASA, if they've refused all services, then what can we do? If he was on a public street today without the public storage, I basically would have no recourse. So I think a subcommittee conversation would be very helpful, including how do we champion the city council to maybe push some like legislation so that we can put some power into the hands of the PD you know, potentially so that we can enforce safety a lot better for the residents. Okay. So that's something we don't really need to vote on. That can just be delegated to the Bring it into the subcommittee and we will work on that because you're not the only one facing it. There's others in our area that are facing the same crisis and issue and they're at wit's end and don't know what to do. So we're going to be a resource for them to be able to do it. Just, just like Lhasa wasn't responding to you, I made one call and the next day they were there. So we can do stuff like that. As a neighborhood council, we have that power. We're able to direct services. It's right in the charter. That's all we got to do is start really expanding upon that. We were really impressed by how quickly they showed up. We had no idea that you placed a call. Yeah. Um, so, so thank you for that. We were like, oh my God, we had no idea. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Yeah, so I do know a lot of people at the mayor's office, so it does help. Just so everyone understands, um, what will happen is this will have a standing, you know, subcommittee has a standing um, spot on the, ro on the roster, on the agenda each month, so that you'll be able to give a report and what's going on. So, versus the working group, which is more specifically forming a task to figure out um, whatever plan they want to present to uh, the committee as a one-time thing. So that's kind of the difference. Okay. Um, with that, is there any other, you know, being that some people came in late past general public comment, if there's any other general public comment that uh, anyone want to throw in? One question. What happened over in Culver City on Washington? Do you guys know Chris or Jose? That was the sh officer involved shooting. Yeah. That's all I know. I don't know anything so else. Uh, from what I heard from the sheriff's department is investigating that for Culver City PD. Uh, there was a call of a individual that is believed to be a, a transient, a homeless person, and he was armed with a knife. He was uh, initially confronted by maintenance personnel where he became aggressive. So the maintenance personnel pulled out and called uh, the Culver City Police Department. They engaged with the individual uh, my understanding is he became aggressive, uh, armed with a knife, uh, which resulted in an officer-involved shooting. One officer was struck by gunfire, but it was friendly gunfire. Uh, so, uh, but the individual uh, succumbed to the, his injuries. But that, that's kind of the, in a nutshell, what occurred there. Okay, and then the second thing, what is the investigation going on? Because on Pico Bull, who is we actually responded with LA Fire, um, was the HTC, uh, I'm not even sure what it was, but they had butane everything, the illegal operation of the, uh, I'm not even sure what, it, marijuana oils or whatever was over on Pico Boulevard and um, right near Doheny. Yeah, so that, uh, Bela actually inquired about that at the beginning of the meeting. Okay. And, uh, I'm going to inquire. I've heard the same rumors that it may have been some type of marijuana operation, but once again, I, that's here's oh, the Chris, point. I was on scene. I know exactly. Cause we were, cause okay. I, cause they called us out from fire to be there yeah. and so, it was, and we actually had to pull back because when they, when they made entry, they saw the butane tanks there and immediately pulled back and then just started dumping water on it because they were afraid that they were gonna have another 
uh, incident like they did in downtown LA when that thing blew up uh, a couple uh, month ago and, okay, injured, yeah. and injured fire uh, fire department personnel. Bela actually inquired about that. So if you have a contact at Arson, maybe you can get a follow up on exactly what that was because I was going to mm -hmm. do that for her. Okay, well, it was also though LAPD detectives were there too, and they yeah. were actually taking the lead. And actually, our fire LA, LAFD's arson took a step back because PD, FBI, and the you know that blue uh, governor's they, they've shown up at other events. And I'm not yeah. sure what it is whatever they are in that blue big truck. They showed up too, along with FBI, because of the explosion. All right, I'll take a look into it and see what I can find out. Okay, great, because there, this is the second one, and I know there's more of them in the community, and we got to find out what we need to do as public safety to be able to get those shut down before they turn into another raging fire and possible explosion. Yeah. Okay, anything else, or can we adjourn the meeting? Lori. Jose, aren't you covering for Chris Baker while he's gone? And can I have your serial number so we can email you about issues in our community while he's gone? Yes, uh, my my serial number is going to be four zero two seven three. So it's going to be four zero two seven three at lapd online. Also, if you guys do email Chris Baker's email, all his emails are getting forwarded to me as well. So either way, I'll receive the emails and I'll be able to respond. One last question. Is Chris really coming back after a vacation? <laughs> yes. He'll be back. Can you spell your last name, Jose? Yes, it's uh, B-E-R-M-U-D-E-Z. Okay, thank you. No problem. All right, thank you everybody. Um, fantastic meeting. <laughs> And we even got done before nine. Wow. Uh, Thank, Thank you, Mike. everybody. Bye. Uh, we're adjourning at 8.51. And so hopefully, I don't know, there's, there's a 50-50 chance that I'll see you at the next meeting. Um, like I say, unless I'm under the knife. So. <laughs> Thank you, Terry. Thank you, Michael. We really appreciate your help. Thank well, you, everybody. All right, meeting adjourned. All right. And thank you, Martin. You got it, buddy. Uh, good luck with everything. And let me know if you need anything um, along the way. And, uh, or just want to connect on anything else, okay? You got it. Um, I, got I mean, I can, ho I, I can host your meeting um, the next, for your next meeting if you need me to. However, who your committee members are, uh, as long as they're able to be promoted as, as a, a panelist, I'll know that. So I can do a roll call and, uh, or you can send me a list, but uh, that's, you know, I can probably help right. in that respect or whatever you need if you need me to. I'm but I will be able to. I'm um, Adam to not resign from the committee, but uh, he's, he's really, you know, he just started um, his own venture. Okay. So All it's right. taking up a ton of time. Okay. I'm here. Yeah. Um, okay. So Terry, um, if, if Adam's not able to run it. Um, um, yeah. No problem. Whatever you need. Okay. So Martin, That's why we're board members to help each other. Hey, right, hey, right. So what I'll do then is, um, what I'll do then is I'll just make Terry a co-chair. Um, if, if you give me that direction, just shoot me an email, Mike, what you need, and I'll, I'll make sure to do it as I start your meeting. Okay. Right, and it's a 50-50 chance. I might still, you know, I don't know when the surgery is going to be scheduled yet. We'll find that out tomorrow. And then even then, it, as I found out, we got very close, but not close enough. Okay. Well, I, I wish you the best with everything, everyone in your family. So Thank you. Your and Terry, I'll call you and fill you in on what's been going on. Yeah, because I saw Sandy cool. yesterday. Yes. All right. All right, folks, I'm going to pop and let this off here now. So, hey, hey, Martin, um, real uh, quick, did Elise ever get back to you? Terry, I'm going to uh, fall back up with you. I just got to get in the meeting now, okay? Okay. Okay, thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye, Mike.